I'll start with the introduction. Water baptism has been a ceremony used to formally join a person to Jesus Christ and to the church for millennia. However, because the church has been doing it for so long, it is easy to lose the true meaning and significance of what a person is saying when they are baptized. Today, we will be reminded of the meaning and purpose of water baptism. We also received communion today. The two go hand in hand. In communion, Jesus invites us to a new covenant in which He gives His life in our place so that we can live forever with Him. Water baptism is our formal response to His offer, our yes to Jesus. This is an include sermon because we're talking about including formally people into the body of Christ. Go to Romans chapter 6. If you have your Bibles with you, turn it on, open it up, reboot, whatever it is you do. And I want to just read a few verses to you from Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Paul is continuing an argument that he's already been uh, uh, laying out. May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Therefore, we have been buried with Him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with Him in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. Let me just pause there for a moment. If you've seen a water baptism, I think you might be able to catch that symbolism. You have a person standing in water. And the water represents a grave. And so, when a person is laid down in the water, it's signifying that they die with Christ, and then we don't leave them there, praise God. Jesus doesn't leave us in the grave either. And then we come up out of the grave, signifying not only are we washed, but we're going to live forever with Christ. So, baptism, if you'd notice what Paul said, he said, um, go back to, uh, to verse 4. Therefore, we have been buried with Him through baptism into death. Oh, excuse me, verse 3. We who have been baptized into Christ Jesus. So, not only are we doing something ceremonial, but we're actually joining ourselves to Jesus Christ. So, spiritually, we're now in. That's what the Bible says about Jesus. It says we are in in Christ. We are in Jesus. When we do that, we are taking on that death that He died. Now, why did He have to die? What's that about? I'm only going to touch on this just briefly, but the Old Covenant, the law, was the standard of behavior that God had set. This is how human beings are supposed to live. And if you failed that standard, death was the punishment. Got a little quiet in here. All got a little sobered with that reality. God knew we couldn't do it. So He sent Jesus once for all to die in our place. We could not keep the law. None of us could. So we join ourselves to Jesus in the new covenant, the covenant in His blood. He is the one he is the one who takes our place, who dies our death, and then we get to rise with him because we are in him. Now, it was just a little bit of a personal thing that just happened right there. Torg just jumped in the back of the room. Torg and I have been having this conversation about the law several times. So let me just say, in a sense, theoretically, we could keep the law. Jesus actually 
being the second Adam, did keep the law. He fully and in every way met the law's demands. None of the rest of us have done it. None of the rest of us have been able to, but he did. Died in our place, took our death, and bore it away from us. Water baptism is that outward sign where we take the formal step of saying, that's mine. I belong to Jesus Christ. I receive what he did for me, and I commit to follow him. I think of water baptism like I think of a wedding. I really do. I think of it like a wedding. You know, when, they, when you get at a wedding, you know, the two become one. They're supposed to become one flesh and one family. Names change. People move in. All of the things that are supposed to happen to bond that relationship in permanence are supposed to happen at a wedding. A baptism is the same thing. We are joining ourselves to Christ. All throughout the Scripture in various places, the church is the bride of Christ. He is the husband, and we are the bride. Now, when Kathleen and I got married, this is a little personal here, my part. When we got married, I was no longer in charge of my own life. Can a few wives say amen? <laughs> Before I got married, I was free to date. I was free to ask out any woman who would say yes. Well, I could ask anyone, but if she'd say yes, then I could go out on a date, right? After I said, I do, dating was over. <laughs> Preach it, sister. It was over for Kathleen, too, by the way. But there was a death that took place as I took that step. I've done this when I do, when I do wedding ceremonies. So any of you who are, uh, I guess I should say McConnell, Lonnie, and David, be fair warned. Here it comes. One of the things that I say to couples when we're standing at the altar is I say, there's a truth that you need to get a hold of right now. You're not single anymore. There are some people, believe it or not, that get married and they haven't grasped that reality yet. And they don't die to their single life. And they don't then live the fullness of what a marriage is supposed to be. Because to be alive and intimate and truly trusting your spouse, you got to die to all those other potentials. You got to let go of them. They got to go away. So, how is this like water baptism? If we're going to be truly close to Jesus, if we're going to truly give our lives and give our hearts to Him, then all the other competitors have to die. They have to die. Jesus is a jealous husband. And He wants all of you for Himself. And He will not share you with anybody else. I hope that's romantic. Not limiting. So there has to be a death. But then in that death, then there's a new life. A brand new life that you couldn't have had without Jesus being your husband. Just another note, just another word on, on water baptism being like a wedding. Before salvation and water baptism, I was free to sin. I was free to do as I pleased without any concern about Jesus. Before I got saved, before I said yes to Him, I was doing my thing. I was in charge of my life. I did what I wanted to do. After I take that step, and I understand what Jesus has offered me through the cross and said yes to Jesus' offer of a deeply intimate relationship, I become engaged, if you will. So what am I describing? I'm talking about that space in between when you said yes to Jesus 
yes to salvation, and the time when you formally get water baptized, you get married. You understand what I'm saying? There are some people probably in here who have said yes to Jesus. They've received that salvation. You've received the new birth. That's very real. I'm not saying baptism saves you. But my wife would not have been satisfied with an engagement. How about yours? She wanted the ring, but she wanted that ceremony where I said to everybody, this one's mine, hands off. And at water baptism, we do that same thing. This is that formal declaration that I belong to Jesus. It's an important step for us to take. And if you've not taken it, we're going to baptize in Star Lake at the end of the month. I want you to come. I want you to be prepared for that. Now, why should a, why should a Christian be water baptized? The very first thing that I would say is simply that Jesus modeled it for us. Jesus Himself was baptized even though He had no need to be baptized. Jesus didn't have any sin. He didn't have any need to go and say, you know, I, I need to be washed. I need to be cleansed. But He did know He was going to die. I think what He was doing was simply going into the water with the recognition of I know exactly where this goes. I'm going to die and I'm going to be resurrected. And everybody else who's going to be in me, in relationship with me, is going to have that same experience. So He modeled for us what was going to take place. He modeled the steps that we were supposed to take. So that's the first reason. The second reason is simply that He commanded it. Matthew chapter 28 Verse 19 and 20, the Great Commission. Most of you are familiar with that. Jesus said, go into all the world, if I can find the passage here, and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So He modeled it for us, and then He commanded the disciples that everybody that was going to take that step, take it and be baptized. That was a, an initiation rite, if you will, a beginning of discipleship and that relationship. Thirdly, the apostles placed it immediately as the outward symbol of repentance, of turning away from a sinful life, away from rebellion against God, in commitment to Jesus. Go to Acts chapter 2. I just want to show you that real quick. I want you to see it. Because I want you to see how quickly they took that step. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus is in His resurrected body and He's speaking to the, to the eleven and He's saying, stay in Jerusalem until you be endued with power. When that happens, you'll know it. Things are going to change. Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost and they all begin speaking in tongues and they're preaching to an international group that are there for the festival in Jerusalem. And Peter stands up because there's a whole bunch of people that are mocking them saying somehow they must be drunk. I don't know why being drunk would cause you to speak in another language. I don't think I've ever seen that. But in any case, well... <laughs> speaking of being speaking of being drunk, hold on a second, Tord. Speaking of being drunk, um, I did see somebody wrap their car around a tree the other night because they were drunk. That was a little scary. Um, but they didn't speak in another language at that point. Tord? Yes. These were people that recognized the languages that were being speak, spoken. I wouldn't say indecipherable. I don't think I would agree with that. But in any case, these were languages that the people were hearing that they had from their heart language, as it were. The places that they'd grown up. You remember, the Jews had been scattered all over the place, all over the Mediterranean world. And so they would come back for these festivals to worship God at the temple. And then at that time, God took that strategic opportunity 
to speak to them in a way that would get their attention, that would catch their attention, that something had changed. So, Peter stands up and begins to preach. And he begins to, to say, you guys just crucified the Messiah. And everybody's a little bit scared. And so, when they heard this, verse 37, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent. And what's the next thing he says? Come on. Be baptized. In the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Mind you, all of this was happening next to the temple. And the temple has this whole area of ceremonial bathing. For, they call it a mikvah in Hebrew. It's actually, there's a little stair step. You walk down into it, and you immerse yourself, and then you walk back out the other side. Peter had the opportunity. We don't have a baptismal here. Peter had the opportunity to say to them right now, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to repent. You're supposed to turn away from the way you've been going, and you start following Jesus. To be baptized into His name, that's what it means. I'm going to be in Christ. And so he turned around and he said, there's a whole lot of mikvahs right here. Repent and get baptized in the name of Jesus right now. And they baptized several thousand people right then. The church was born that day. You need to understand, if you've said yes to Jesus, Baptism is something that should follow quickly after. If you get engaged, you don't stay engaged for 20 years. You get married. So if you said yes to Jesus, if you said yes to His offer of relationship, take the next step and get water baptized and say yes to Him and formalize it. The other thing that's important to recognize in this that happened at Acts chapter 2 this was exceedingly public. I don't know if you've seen pictures of Jerusalem. The, the temple mount, that area, is very large. It's very prominent in the city. It's actually an elevated space. And so everybody would be going to and fro. And now you got these guys preaching, and there's a whole bunch of people gathered around them, and now you're going to get baptized in front of all your neighbors and a bunch of your family, and you're going to say, right now, I belong to Jesus. And you do it publicly. I think it's great that we're doing it in a lake. I don't know who's going to be around the lake. I don't know who's going to be fishing. I don't know who's going to be swimming. I don't know who's going to be boating. But it's a public place. And it's a place to say, yeah, I'm giving myself to Jesus. My wedding was public. I said, I'm giving myself to Kathleen. I didn't hide it. I didn't try and somehow keep her you know, hidden away or she keep me hidden away. I'm proud of her. She's mine. Jesus belongs to me. I'm His. And I'm going to publicly declare that. That's an important step in water baptism to say that you belong to Him. Jesus modeled it for us. He commanded us to do it. The apostles placed it immediately as that outward symbol of repentance and joining the family of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and it was done publicly. I want us to take just a couple minutes right now because I think it might be kind of fun for you to do. I want you to tell somebody about your baptism. If you've been baptized... I just want you to talk to him just a little bit about what happened to you when you were baptized. Where you were, when it happened, maybe something that happened to you as it relates to just a little shift or something that happened to you. Go ahead, pair up or triple up. Talk to somebody about your baptism. If you haven't been baptized, then you can just say, I haven't been baptized yet. I'm listening. And just listen to that person. Thank you, Elika, for sharing that. I'm sorry, what was that? Yeah, we, yeah, we stayed. No, we actually didn't, but it was, uh, it was good. You know, when the Lord tells you to do something, and He says, do it now, it is wise to obey. Do what He tells you to do. Do it right now.
you know, I was just I was just telling these guys about my baptism. I got baptized when I was 17. I got saved when I was pretty young, um, but I rededicated my life in high school and got baptized. And uh, I was in a uh, in a I was in California, and so the weather was pretty nice. It was uh, it was an afternoon, and uh, I too got baptized in a jacuzzi like like she did. And uh, you know, one of the things that I just really remember about it that that sticks in my mind is that. There was, there was a bunch of people that I knew all right around the perimeter of that pool. They were watching me take that step. And I say that to you to say, when we do a formal thing like that and we say, I'm giving myself to Jesus and we got all those witnesses, it can be a little unnerving in that sense because you might not like to be the center of attention. But the other thing that it really does is it strengthens us in that we know that we know we did it. We can go ask those people, did I get baptized? Did I really take that step? I was there. I was sitting right across the pool from you. We did that. It was that day. It's an important thing to do it publicly and to take that step before others that can hold us accountable to the commitments that we made. Um. We had planned to be over, but I'm going to just say it's our first Sunday, and it took us a little while to get started. So it's it's almost quarter after now. I feel like the preacher that can't stop talking. But I'm going to finish here real quick, and then we're going to have potluck. So how does baptism change my relationship to Jesus? As I said before, my relationship with Jesus begins the moment I say yes with my whole heart. You don't have to be baptized to be saved, to have salvation occur. So if you know someone, you know, and yeah, amen. We got fresh air and carbon monoxide. If you know someone, you know, they weren't baptized, but you know they gave their heart to Jesus and then they died before they got baptized, they're with Jesus. Okay? So don't get freaked out about a ceremony. I'm not saying... This is your salvation experience. But it is that public declaration. And we need to make that public declaration. It's important that we do that. When I say yes to Jesus, that's my saving moment. That's my salvation. That's when the new birth happens. Water baptism formally declares it to people. But secondly, and this is equally as important, it declares it to the spiritual realm, to the spiritual world, that truth has now happened. I have another sermon. I hate it when that happens. Um, I'll just go back briefly. Okay. The Bible says we are the slave of the one whom we obey. Paul says it in Romans. If we're sinning, Jesus said, Anyone who sins is a slave to sin. We had a relationship. We were attached to Satan. Satan's the one that brought us into sin. And because we continued to sin and continued to obey him, we had a relationship, if you will, attached. You understand what I'm saying? At water baptism, we're making a public declaration I'm divorcing you and I'm marrying Jesus. And we make it public in front of everybody and God and the whole spiritual realm. And we say, I now belong to Jesus. That's why the relationship, you have to die. You have to die and then be resurrected and become part of Jesus Christ. Okay, I did that fairly quickly. Like I said before, when it comes to a wedding, you die to old relationships. I am only alive to this spouse. I have no other. This is the relationship that is central. Okay. This does not, of course, mean after your baptism that you won't face temptations to reattach to Satan and to the ways of this world. Because you get baptized does not mean you will live temptation or sin-free. Oh, I wish it was so. It is not. 
And so I don't want you freaked out that right after you get baptized, you suddenly get major temptation. If you were the devil, wouldn't you do that? Hey, let's wreck this as soon as we possibly can. And so the enemy comes right in there and he'll begin to work on that. Are you going to be perfect after you get baptized? No. The same is certainly true of a marriage commitment. Um, you know, I got married to Kathleen, but I didn't decide that all the rest of the women on the world were ugly after that. <laughs> Straight up, you know, just being honest. You know, and, and the enemy goes, hey, did you see that? Did you see that? Well, hey, that's real. But I made my commitment. I belong to Kathleen and not to anyone else. It's the same thing we're doing with water baptism. Doesn't mean you won't be tempted. Doesn't mean you won't struggle. Just means you've made the step. It does not mean if you are imperfect in your commitment, you must be rebaptized. I do not always succeed in my attempts to be totally faithful to Kathleen. Now, I am not admitting to adultery here. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that there are temptations, there are things that come at me, and I am not always perfect in my mind where it should be. Just keeping it real. Thankfully, Kathleen is gracious. We have not been divorced and remarried and divorced and remarried over and over and over again. And it is the same thing with your relationship with Jesus. He knows you're not perfect. He's perfect. You're joining yourself to Him. When God the Father sees you, you're in Christ. And so He can allow His Holy Spirit to come and indwell you. Jesus has paid our sin debt, all the past sin debt, and all the future sin debt. We are covered. So what are we doing? We are walking this thing out. Step at a time. Becoming like Him. Becoming sanctified. Being holy. Learning how to be like Jesus. Baptism is part of that step. But it doesn't mean that if I make a mistake or if I actually sin on purpose that I have to go get rebaptized. Doesn't mean that. Let me conclude. I almost started another sermon again. On the day of Pentecost, Peter invited the people who heard his sermon to repent of their sin and publicly declare themselves followers of Jesus Christ. I'm inviting everybody in the room to do the same thing. If you have not declared yourself a follower of Jesus, first off, I'd like you to do so right now and then get baptized. I've given you the address and we're going to get baptized in the lake. I want to take a moment and just give anybody who hasn't already said yes to Jesus the opportunity to say yes to Him. And then soon, end of the month, we'll formalize it with water baptism. Would you pray with me? All I'm going to do is I'm just going to pray a prayer. In the church, you're going you're to follow me in it. And if you have not said yes to Jesus, but you want to say yes to Him, this is the step you take to enter in to the new birth, to enter in to His kingdom, to enter into relationship with Him. So church, just repeat after me to give people a little bit of privacy. But I'm telling you, if you take these steps, He hears you. If you're speaking it with faith and you haven't done this before, you're going to initiate something right now. Lord Jesus, I want to receive Your offer of friendship, of washing my life, of all the crud, all the things I've done that are wrong. And giving me in that place hope, freedom, life, truth, and an eternity to live with You. I humble myself. I admit my sin. And I say, Lord, come make me new. 
I want to be yours. Amen. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer, you've taken that step, and you really mean it, I want you to come talk to me. I want to baptize you because I want to make it publicly known to take that step. Lord Jesus, I thank You. I thank You for this new start in this new spot, in this new building, in this new place. Lord, I thank You. It is so nice and cool in here. (laughs) We are so grateful for Your leading and Your guiding that You brought us to this place. Lord, I pray Your blessing and Your grace on us now as we fellowship and as we get to enjoy a meal together. Thank You, Lord. Amen and amen.